Hello, love bugs, and welcome to the August 2020 Vamp Storytelling Showcase Plan B, which is about as prescient and useful a theme for our times as we could have ever hoped for. We've been a little bit of a struggle bus over here at Sociate. We're all trying to make sure that the stories don't stop, and the stories will not stop. But what you're going to get to see in the coming months is us making sure that our mysterious office, located in the outer forgotten regions of East County, San Diego, are able to beam to you the stories that you need to hear on a continual basis in better quality going forward. So, that said, if something goes wrong with tonight's stream, rest assured, this video has already been uploaded to our Facebook page and our YouTube page, so you can visit it at any time on your own some. But while you're here, while we're all here in this streaming capacity, please get into this chat because what we miss the most besides the stories is the community. We want to hear from you. We miss your faces. We miss your words. We want to talk. Uh, and we also apologize to um, online dating services for not being the best online date destination in San Diego since we don't have a live show anymore. We will get back to that as soon as quarantine lifts. This month, instead of streaming a live night of performances from our mysterious Eastern County location, uh, we've worked with our contributors to record them remotely from their respective safe places and compile the show for your enjoyment. So, while we continue to yearn for the day we can see all of your faces in person again, the stories still don't stop. And here is your lineup tonight. In order, Laura McCaffrey, James Sutton, Arthur Salm, Ali Puente Douglas, Ron Pickett, and Mr. Doug Bradley. I would like to note, James, Ron, and Doug all come to us from the Veteran Writers Division, which is just one program among many that thrives because of your support. So if you haven't already, please do consider becoming a sustaining member of So Say We All, which you can do by going to So Say We All dot wildapricot dot org and signing up at whatever level you're capable of joining at. Without further ado, my friends, here is the August 2020 Vamp Storytelling Showcase Plan B. Enjoy. As long as I can remember, depression has made me feel like there were gray clouds following me everywhere. The depression and anxiety impacted my self-confidence, but I often got reminders from my father that I deserved to be seen. There was no reason I should doubt myself as often as I did in his eyes. I was 25 when I lost my dad. Grief coupled with the traumatic experience of going to trial to get justice for his death turned the gray clouds that followed me into a typhoon. My dad had been driving home on his motorcycle. There were three cars in the left turn lane going west at the intersection of Balboa Avenue and Mount Everest Avenue. The one in the middle was 27-year-old San Diego police officer Michael Justin Bruce in a police SUV. Bruce was called to assist with a hit and run, according to his deposition. Bruce turned on his lights, said he couldn't remember if he turned on his sirens, witnesses deposed said he didn't, and swung his SUV around the car in front of him and accelerated into the intersection while he still had a red light. At the same time, my dad entered the intersection on his motorcycle. Two years after that accident, I ended up in that courtroom when my family decided to sue the city of San Diego. After years of legal fuckery of submitting various documents to various courts, the city admitted liability. The move meant a jury would only be able to decide the amount of damages we'd receive. I was 27 years old when I walked to the front of the courtroom and took my seat at the stand. I looked back at the courtroom that was staring at me. I felt like I could see everyone and everything clearly. The defense attorney walked over to her place at the podium. A reptilian smile stretched across her leathery orange skin. It was as nearly distracting as the lime green lady suit with matching platform stripper heels she was wearing. 
Bracing myself for cross-examination, I knew she would try to make me look bad. She tried to claim that my father's death didn't impact me that much, and I was just a fuck-up that wanted money. She dug into my education, specifically classes I took for my political science degree. You took classes on fascism and nationalism, she inquired. The defense zeroed in on my career, how I wanted to be a journalist, and seemed to imply that I'd been trying, without avail, to make it even before my father died. My lawyer later explained that defense was trying to demonstrate that I couldn't keep a job and therefore the death of my father hadn't damaged me fiscally or psychologically, meaning I already sucked to begin with. The fascism questions, I don't know what she was trying to say, maybe if I was a fascist or a nationalist, either way, her cross-examination questions were meant to inflame the jury so they'd hate me and award me fewer damages. Bruce was in the courtroom galley wearing a navy blue suit. I stared at him, wanting him to feel the same discomfort I felt. He stared straight ahead, avoiding my gaze. I knew she was just doing her job, but it was very hard not to internalize the defense attorney's remarks. It would come back to haunt me for days on end, challenging my self-confidence, and later send me on a bout of imposter syndrome. I heard of this term before, but I didn't realize it was happening to me. Imposter syndrome is described as chronic self-doubt and intellectual fraudulence that persists despite accomplishments. The Monday after the trial's closing arguments, my family gathered in our lawyer's office to await the jury's deliberation on the amount of damages we were to be awarded. We were gearing up for a long wait when we received a call telling us the jury was ready for us. I worried as we hustled down the street to the courthouse. How could they make a huge decision that quickly, I thought. Like the various dramas I've watched on TV, the, George, the judge said something along the lines of, so the jury has come to a decision. And the lead jury member, a white middle-aged man in cargo shorts that looked like he should have been making a weekend run to Home Depot, not attending a wrongful death trial, handed over a folder containing the results of their few hours of deliberation. The court clerk read the amount of damages out loud, which sounded really low. It was closer to what the defense had prompted the jury to award us, basically an amount less than what it took to maintain the Miramar landfill, but higher than what she had asked. The defense came to their suggestion using a weird methodology based kind of on what my dad made during his career and then her own personal opinion. The jury's decision made me think the defense's disparaging remarks of my family and I were legitimate. All I could think was, we were wrong. The jury thinks we're wrong. Outside the courtroom, the defense attorney listened to the jurors explain their reasoning for picking the damage amount. We did what made sense, I heard the man in cargo shorts say, matter of fact. What made sense, cargo shorts? That my dad's life was reduced to what they thought his paycheck might have been? The defense's assassination of my career, education, lifestyle? The way she made it seem like spending money on a handful of Europe trips is a crime? The fact we even tried to get justice? It was a question that kept me up for nights on end post-trial. It was a question that made me wonder out loud when I was by myself. I'd imagine answering the defense's questions differently, maybe berating her or making fun of her weird outfits. It was a question that exacerbated the anxiety and depression I already had. One day, 
My lack of self-confidence, coupled with anxiety and depression, made me do something I thought was the biggest mistake of my life at the time. I was 29 when I started working as a reporter for a small business weekly. I should have been excited, but I couldn't help but feel like an imposter. All the other jobs I had applied to had rejected me. How could this place possibly want me when no one else, not even jurors at our trial, believed in me, I wonder. This responsibility awarded, me, awarded to me worsened my anxiety. I thought that the feeling would leave, but I started to wake up to mild panic attacks each morning. I'd spend some moments hovering over the porcelain crown for an anxiety-induced throw obsession. I could go to work eventually, but the morning, morning terrors got worse. I don't deserve this, I kept thinking. I shouldn't be here. Then my anxiety culminated into a full-blown panic mode when I had to cancel a reporting trip one day. I was nearly at my destination when I needed to U-turn and drive home when anxiety overcame me. At home, I succumbed to a panic attack that kept me up the entire night. I called my editor the next morning and awkwardly explained I had a panic attack and that I was going to the doctor before returning to work. The doctor prescribed Zoloft, which is used for treating depression and anxiety, as well as Xanax. The Xanax had immediate effects, stopping shallow breathing and mind racing panic attacks produced. But the trade-off was that it made me too sleepy to work or drive. Zoloft, however, takes a while to set in. No therapists were available for immediate appointments, which made matters even worse. My anxiety raged on till I was having a week-long panic attack. I couldn't bring myself to go to the office. I began losing weight quickly as I had to vomit constantly from anxiety. I began to feel like I was going to die if this continued, so I called the office and quit. The anxiety left, but a nearly equally unbearable shame took its place. It took quitting a job I wanted to realize how much the trial impacted me. The people in the trial, the defense attorney and jury, they were just doing their jobs, but their jobs crippled me. They made me doubt my abilities so much that I threw away the only opportunity I felt like I had at the time. Recovering from the shame was hard at first, but slowly, I started to feel like my old self again. I eventually had enough serotonin in my body from the Zoloft that it began to take effect. Seeing a therapist every other week gave me perspective on my issues and encouraged self-confidence. I got the job I had before the Business Weekly back. Having a familiar routine made me feel normal again. There was a glimmer of hope between the gray clouds, a chance I could transform and change. Once that happened, I started to thrive. I found a better paying job writing. I got my own column in the local Alt Weekly, won an award for an article, and wrote things I was really proud of. I also started realizing that I deserve more. That new job was okay, but I knew I was good enough to be published in big magazines and publications, and I could win more awards. When rejections happened, my treatment softened the blow to my ego. What the defense thought, whatever the jury thought, those were just people doing their jobs. This was something I knew at the time, but it wasn't something I truly believed. I still have some bad days, of course, but there's usually always a silver lining, even on the gloomiest of days. The Repelling Tower on Marine Base Camp Pendleton in Southern California's coastal scrublines was large, wooden, flat-faced, square, and entirely intimidating. It looked like a Viking Age siege machine. 
I and a few, a few dozen other midshipmen were seated cross-legged in front of a Marine sergeant. He was barrel-chested and altogether serious, with an already kind of angry look on his face. The sergeant intended to train us in repelling. I got the impression that training midshipmen was not what he joined the Corps to do. Midshipmen was the rank given to future Navy and Marine Corps officers in training. Every summer, we spent a few weeks with active duty fleet units as part of our training. This summer, my second of three summers in officer training, we were spending one of those weeks with the Marines. It was a chance to both give us training we'd need to be successful officers and also for the Marine Corps to pitch itself as a career option for us when we finally selected our service. As for me, I wanted to drive ships or fly airplanes for the Navy. To get there, I had to successfully complete my training as a midshipman, even this week with the Marines. Most of the Marines who had been training us that week were combat veterans of Desert Storm, which had been less than two years before. The sergeant covered how the repelling seat would be rigged once we were atop the tower, how we needed to listen to the Marines who were up there and follow their directions, how to move our feet and our brake hand. I wasn't going to become a Marine officer, and I suspected Marines hardly ever found themselves repelling into combat anyway. Besides, we were still two years from being commissioned, so we'd surely forget whatever they taught us about repelling by then. Maybe this was just a recruiting gimmick. Join the Marines, it'll be fun. Well, whatever. There had been other things in my training thus far that I had thought of as having limited future value. This might be cool. I'd never gone repelling before and it sounded exciting, though the tower, now that I was close to it, seemed awfully tall. People have, and occasionally still do, managed to injure, maim, or even kill themselves on these towers, the sergeant said. It's hard, but it's possible. I hope to God one of you won't. Personally, I wouldn't care. But apparently the taxpayer has already spent a shit ton of money for your cushy schooling, so it'd be a waste of their investment if it went splat at the bottom of my tower. Plus the paperwork. Damn, there'd be a lot of paperwork. I ain't got time for that. Fortunately for us, if you listen to my Marine instructors and do what they say, you won't go splat. At least one of you won't listen. One of you sitting in front of me right now will not move your feet like I told you and get yourself upside down. I guarantee it. When that happens, you could fall out of your seat. And I already told you, I ain't got time for the paperwork. So listen and move your feet. There's so many of you, we likely only have time for one down each. Questions? We had none. If the sight of the tall tower up close had started to make me feel a bit anxious about this, the sergeant's brief kept that going. Now, which of you are afraid of heights? I didn't raise my hand. I wasn't afraid of heights. Somebody's hand went up. Okay, you're first. Get your ass up to the top of the tower. That struck me as mildly cruel. But I had seen worse petty cruelty in my training before. It seemed to be part of the gig. There was a brief moment of silence while the guy who raised his hand entertained a fantasy that the sergeant was joking. Then he reluctantly got up and went to the side of the tower. Groups quickly followed the one who was afraid of heights and started rappelling down. Some quickly, some slowly, some in big jumps, some in tiny jumps, but down they came. When the first midshipman got to the bottom, the sergeant asked him, are you still afraid of heights? He nodded, breathing heavily. Yes, sergeant. Well, Get your ass back up there. You guys, wait, wait. This one goes again next. I shook my head to myself. As the procession continued, we'd cheer or jeer as our friends came down with varying levels of grace, but mostly we just chatted amongst ourselves while waiting our turn. Ah, damn it, the sergeant said. I looked up at the tower. At the top, a Marine was leaning out over the edge, looking down. About six feet below him, still near the top of the tower, a midshipman, not the one afraid of heights, hung perfectly upside down. His heels, butt, and back flat against the face of the tower. He was frozen, eyes staring straight out from the wall. His hands were visibly white from the death grip he was maintaining on the rope. Look at me, look at me, the Marine shouted down from the top. The midshipman didn't react. Uh, what's his name, the Marine shouted down to us. The name was provided and he tried again with the name. This time, the midshipman looked up past his feet at the Marine. Good job. Now, if you can do that, you can get out of this. You just have to listen to me and do what I say, just like, I, just like you did just now. Take your right foot and slide it down towards your butt, putting it flat, no, no, your other right foot. Now push out and no, 
waved. Uh, um, okay, good job. The midshipman managed to get on his feet and the Marine talked him through rappelling the rest of the way down. When he got to the bottom, the sergeant unhooked him and said, you did it. Now, even if we have time, that's it for you today. Another landed right next to them, finishing a rappel. Still afraid? The sergeant asked the new arrival. Yes, sergeant. You know what to do. The midshipman's shoulders dropped. Without a word, he headed toward the side of the tower to go up again, his face as pale as the first time. The sergeant shook his head and chuckled. Then it was my turn to climb. At the side of the tower, the ladder approved, proved to at the side of the tower, the ladder proved to be just boards nailed to the side. There wasn't much room to grip with fingers or place feet, but I started to climb up. It was even further than it looked from the ground. About halfway up, I glanced down and a shot of adrenaline popped through me. It already looked high enough that if I slipped, I'd be in for broken legs. I tried to push that out of my head and kept climbing. None of the trees I had climbed as a kid had this far of an unobstructed drop. To my dismay, there was also nothing special to help the transition from the side to the top, no handles or anything. My fingers found a small crack and with my heart pounding, I awkwardly pulled myself on my stomach to the top. I stood and my head swam. The top of the tower was completely flat. I had assumed that the three sides that weren't used for repelling would have rails. They didn't. I didn't know why that bothered me so much, but boy did it. The ground seemed very far below. A fall would definitely kill me. Nothing was preventing me from toppling over the side. Someone could back up, not seeing me, and accidentally push me over. Then the tower itself began to sway, tilting crazily. My brain urged me to stop it. I reminded myself that the tower was not swaying. I was just reacting poorly. I stared at the edge of the tower and noted the spot on the ground beyond it in my line of sight. It didn't move. It wasn't swaying. With this proof, I forced myself to stare out at the horizon and breathe. It was actually a nice view. This worked. I felt a little better. My heart was definitely pounding. Maybe I was afraid of heights and I had never known it. I turned and took the short steps toward the Marine who was rigging everyone's seats. That only took a couple of minutes. The rig was far simpler than I expected. Really just a piece of rope wrapped around me in between my legs in a special way that I'd never remember. I wondered if it would really hold me. The Marine handed me the carabiner to hold up to keep things situated on my body properly until I was hooked up. I noticed my hand was shaking when I took it. If he noticed, he didn't say anything. I turned toward a Marine at the edge, one of two sending midshipmen over in two lanes. I wasn't having any fun at this point. I wanted off that tower. There was only one way. The guy in front of me finished his rappelling and the Marine at the edge walked toward me. He gave my rig a second check, then he hooked up the rope to my carabiner. I grabbed the line trailing behind me in my brake hand and the line in front of me with the other like I was told. Okay, piece of cake, you're all hooked up. Turn around and back toward the edge until your heels are over, and when I say go, jump off. Once you're stable, look up at me, and I'll tell you to continue rappelling down. Got it? I nodded and started backing up toward the edge. My knees felt weak. The rope in front of me snaked across the top of the tower to the anchor point. It seemed like far too much slack. A vision appeared to me. I could bring in all that slack, get the line taut against my carabiner. Then, instead of leaping off the top, I could ease myself over the edge. I would feel the security of the line. I could test it with a little bit of pull before I trusted my life with it. Relief swept over me. I could do it that way. I was safe. Without thinking further, I pulled in the rope with my front hand, stinking it out the back with my brake hand. The slack, satisfy, satis, uh, the slack satisfyingly started to disappear. A puzzled look passed over the Marine's face. Wait, what? No, oh, no, no, no. He strode toward me, grabbed the rope out of my hand, and gave it a big yank. It flowed back through my hands and spilled into a slack pile on the top of the tower. You don't need any of that crap. He slapped his open hand on my chest and then closed his fist and twisted, grabbing a whole knot of my uniform shirt. Then he pushed me back until my heels felt the edge. Then he kept pushing. I kept my feet on the edge, legs and back ramrod straight as my head and torso were pushed out at an angle over the ground. See, I got you here. 
he pushed and pulled me back and forth over the precipice as I tilted on my straight legs and frozen feet. I pictured tumbling head over heels as he threw me off the tower, but he didn't do that. Then my mind pictured his grip accidentally slipping. I stopped breathing. See, I got you. See, you don't need that. Perfectly safe. He was shaking his head slightly. One of his eyes was open wider than the other. His eyebrow arched high. He pulled me back upright and released me, stepping back a few steps to where he was standing before and gave the rope another yank loose for good measure. Then he stood, arms folded, and watched me closely. There was even more slack in front of me now than there was before my attempt at fixing it. My knees went from weak to shaking. Now, back up so your heels are over the edge, and when I say jump, jump. I backed up till my heels were over the edge, trying my best not to think. Jump, the Marine said. I didn't. I looked back down at all that slack on the top of the tower. I tried to calculate whether I could pull the slack in and ease myself over the side before he reacted. I tried to calculate what would happen if I refused to go. Would he throw me off? Would, he, would I fail the training? Would I have to figure out how to get back on that treacherous excuse for a ladder? My heart's banging and my chest started to become overpowering. My mouth dry as sandpaper. I felt a little sick. I looked up at the Marine. His eyes narrowed and I made a choice. I stepped backwards off the tower. I dropped with an awful suddenness and acceleration. The side of the tower rushed up past my field of view. I thought it should catch, but it didn't. My breath did and I continued to accelerate. The wood side of the tower a blur, the sound of air rushing past my ears when I was sure it never would. The rope caught with a jerk. I stopped falling and swung toward the tower where my feet landed solidly with a thud in the perfect repelling position. Though I hadn't thought about any of it, my brake hand was in the right place, my front hand was good, my feet were right where they were supposed to be, and I was perched safe and sound. I bounced slightly in my rigged seat. Exhilaration surged through me like a tsunami, drowning out all fear under its joy. I had done it. I wasn't sure I could, but I had done it. I had remembered what they had taught me and had done it without thinking, and it had saved my life. I had taken the leap. I had done something I was afraid of. I was king of the world, high on the endorphins pumping through me. If I could do this, I could do anything. I looked up toward the Marine with my face fixed firmly in the platonic shape of triumph. What do you want? A cookie? Repel down. Ha ha, I had bested him too. I looked down and pushed off slightly, moving my brake hand out and dropping a foot or two. And moving my brake hand back, I swung back to the tower. I repeated, this was fun. I shoved out hard and let myself fall for a good stretch. This time the acceleration filled me with happiness. All too soon I was on the ground. The tower wasn't tall enough. I'll go again, the sergeant, I told the I'll go again, I told the sergeant. Don't think there's time, he said, motioning me to sit back down with the others who had gone already. I joined them, joking and laughing and reveling in this new shared experience. The sergeant stood before us again. Well, none of you died, so I don't have any extra paperwork and I'm grateful about that last part. We laughed. Now, where's my freight of heights? I looked down at my lap. When is enough? I felt bad for my fellow midshipmen. I didn't want to listen to what would come next. He raised his hand once again, surely feeling more dread about it than me. I want to tell you something. You listening? He nodded. You did outstanding today. I looked back up. I know it's hard to be honest like that, especially in front of your peers. And when the consequences of your honesty weren't pleasant, you kept right on being honest anyway. Since I knew you were afraid, I could watch you perform under stress. You did everything right and never called it quits. Stubborn integrity, courage, ability to do, build, ah, stubborn integrity, courage, ability to listen, think, and act under pressure. What the hell else could I want in my officer? And you already had it. We were wrapped. The midshipman gaped at him. Shit, I've seen enough. If you ordered me to, I'd follow you into battle this very night. And I hope you consider becoming a Marine, so someday we can do that together, you and me. Hoorah! The other Marines barked, and we tried to imitate. The midshipman was smiling sheepishly. Someone knocked his hat off. Another shouted, teacher's pad. The sergeant smiled and said, see you all in the fleet. We boarded the buses.
I never repelled again in my military career. But there were other fearful days in my future. That time we had to climb a boarding ladder mid-ocean without a lee as night fell and the weather worsened. Near collisions with me on the bridge of my ship. That storm in the South China Sea when I thought the bow might just snap off. Those dark nights on the Egyptian coast just after 9-11. Those terrible couple of days in Afghanistan. Other days when I would need to lean on my trust in my shipmates and in my training. Days when I would need to lean on my trust that fear was not a weakness that needed to stop me from functioning. It would be a few years before I really appreciated, before it really sunk in, that we hadn't gone to that tower to learn anything about repelling. Thanks for listening to my lessons. It started with a foot drop. I said to my father, what's going on with your foot? He and my mother had driven down to San Diego from Carlsbad to have dinner with me. This was when he was about 79, she was a few years younger. I had noticed as we were walking into the restaurant that his right foot was dragging along the ground, kind of scraping as he swung his leg forward. It's been kind of dropping, he said. No big deal. I got a checkup in a couple of weeks. Turns out it was a big deal. He was diagnosed with a degenerative nerve disease. Slow moving, but still. The scary part was that it had the possibility of developing into ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Over the next year, my father's foot drop became more pronounced. He had some problems with fine motor skills, but generally all was well. He was well, and then he wasn't. The disease had developed into ALS. ALS is a super degenerative nerve disease. Um, people lose all control of their muscles. Uh, Stephen Hawking was an outlier. Um, he lived a long time, but most people only live a few years. They gradually lose control of all of their muscles, um, although their minds remain unaffected. Uh, as their bodies waste away, they're sharp as ever. And that means that they know exactly what is happening to them. Within a few months of the diagnosis, my father was no longer able to hold a book and could barely manage newspapers. He wore only sweatshirts, sweatpants, and slippers because buttons, zippers, and shoelaces were in the past. Um, he hated being seen with a walker and would leave the house only to go with my mother to the grocery store because he could use the shopping carts as a walker and stroll around like everybody else and to go for rides in the car. The rides relaxed him, and they were becoming more and more frequent because he'd started having panic attacks. I mean, how could he not? Every day, he was watching himself die a little more. It wasn't long before he couldn't manage trips to the grocery store. My mother was his sole caretaker, and she didn't like leaving him by, him by himself, so to give her a break, I started driving to Carlsbad more and more often. One day, not long after she'd left for the grocery store, my father's hand started shaking. He put it up to his face and said, I don't feel so good. Panic attack. I said, let's go for a ride. I managed to get him out the side door to the driveway. I helped him to my car, where he insisted on making his own way around to the passenger side, leaning on the car, stepping sideways, kind of moving hand over hand. He fell into the seat. I buckled the seatbelt and we were off. We drove around for about 20 minutes. Mostly we talked politics. My father was a lifelong Democrat and he loved the old saying, I'd vote for a yellow dog before I'd vote for a Republican. He especially liked saying it after he and my mom got a yellow dog. By the time we got home, he'd calmed down. He worked his way around the car then held onto my arm for the short trip to the house. I opened the door. There was a small step as he was moving up the step, he collapsed straight back into my arms. Now, he was down to about 130 pounds by then, but that was 130 pounds I wasn't expecting. It, it kind of staggered me. Um, 
I set him down right there where he was on the tile just inside the door. Immediately, he said, help me up. I could tell he found his situation humiliating. I said, just a sec, and I reached around him for his walker and set it in front of him and walked around behind him, got him under both arms and said, ready? He said, just pick me up. So I did. Got him almost all the way upright. He had grabbed onto the handles of the walker and was struggling to get to a full standing position when he collapsed again. This time I was ready. I caught him. I sort of carried, dragged him to a chair just a few feet away and sat him down. He slumped over sideways. I sat him up straight. I looked at him. Dad? Nothing. His eyes were open and blank. I took his pulse. Nothing. There are a lot of stories in which someone discovers that something terrible has happened or they're badly shocked. And the character says, I don't know how long I stood there. It could have been a minute. It could have been an hour. But I know almost exactly how long I stood there because I was doing some intense mental calculations. And I figure it took about 15 or 20 seconds. Here was my thought process. He's had either a massive heart attack or a devastating stroke. If he somehow survives this, the last few months of his life will be spent in a painful, miserable, confused non-recovery as the ALS finishes him off. If I call 911 right now, my paramedics might get here in time to revive him. I walked into the kitchen to get a glass of water, walked back, and set the glass on a small table next to him. I needed it to be there. I waited. A minute passed. Two. Three. I was numb. Catatonic almost. Four minutes. And then, not wanting my mother to arrive before the ambulance, I called 911. When I heard sirens, I went out to meet the EMTs. As the ambulance pulled up, a car was right behind it. My mother. I directed the EMTs into the house then headed her off before she reached the front door. She said, all the way up the hill, I kept hoping the ambulance would turn, and it never did. An EMT blocked our view into the room where they were working on it, but I stole a glimpse. CPR is not how it's depicted on TV. It's an alarmingly violent procedure. And damned if those EMTs didn't get his heart started. I said to myself, no, no, no. It had been at least 10 minutes. After they left with my father, my mother and I robotically repositioned the table and chairs that had been pushed aside to clear space for them to work on him. I thought he was okay at first, I lied. I even brought him a glass of water. My brother drove down from LA that night. My sister flew in from the East Coast the next morning. Our mother sent us to Tri-City Hospital to make decisions. She said she couldn't do it. When we got there, the doctors told us there was essentially no brain activity. Regaining consciousness would be impossible. And if they were somehow wrong about that, the short rest of his life would be, as I had imagined, horrific. Shaken as we were, we decided on the spot. Take him off life support. Now, we were led to a small room. Soft lighting, Soft chairs, soft sofa, lots of beige. We sat there for a few minutes in silence. I couldn't stand it. I found his room just as the nurse was about to remove the breathing tube. For the second time in two days, I was told, you don't want to see this. And this time I didn't. As I sat with my father, I said nothing to him because I knew he wasn't there. Or if he somehow was there, he wouldn't appreciate it. He'd consider it melodrama, emotional, bl emotional blather. Instead, I mentally traced the path of his life as I watched him. Born in Southern Indiana, where his mother died in 1918 of the pandemic when he was three. Prestigious Swarthmore College. Staff Sergeant in the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II. 
where he spent all of that war on an airbase in Brazil, sending and receiving Morse code. Returning home to uh, the family retail business, women's clothing. This is the opening of uh, one of their stores in Northern Kentucky in August 1950, exactly 70 years ago. He and my mom moved to uh, Southern California, start their own business. Uh, they eventually had four stores in North San Diego County and Southern Orange County. Here's an ad from the Escondido store, 1980. And finally, after 40 years of working six days a week, retirement, in which he surprised all of us by being perfectly happy, doing absolutely nothing. And now, finally, right here, this hospital, this room. His internal systems and organs, which had been pumping and firing away for 81 years, took about half an hour to shut down. I went to tell my brother and sister. Then we went home to mom. My mother's 98 now, doing pretty well living in a retirement home in Carlsbad. She has only one complaint about her situation. She says, almost everybody here is a Republican. For political companionship, she watches Rachel Maddow. I've never told her about what I did the afternoon of my father's collapse. How, on the fly, with no authority, I made that decision. And she never will know. I've made that decision too. There's so much we don't know or don't understand or think we know, but we don't. That little piece of hurtful knowledge will not be a part of her. There's a great line that comes from I don't know where. But for me, it explains everything. It goes something like, life is just the occasional spark that gets thrown off when matter rubs against itself for long enough. Shakespeare's Hamlet referred to life as a brief candle. I thought about that as I watched my father's weakening candle flicker, then die. For a while, however briefly, it radiated heat and light, and that should be enough. At an IHOP in Schertz, Texas, I cleared my plate of an entire Rudy Tutti fresh and fruity combo. Next to me was my new boyfriend. His parents sat across from us in the booth. I was nearly 18 and about to start the long drive home after spending the night at their house. Looking at the damage I'd done, I mused, wow, I must have been really hungry. My boyfriend's mother preferred sitting cross-legged in the booth because at her diminutive height, her feet barely grazed the floor. But she gathered herself up to her full height and grinned before chirping. Well, that's what happens when you work up an appetite at night, sweetheart. Embarrassment flushed across my face. Evidently, in all of our youthful exuberance, we had not been as quiet as we thought the night before. My embarrassment intensified with each roaring laugh of my boyfriend's dad. This bear of a man, this barrel-chested former football player, slapped his knee and nearly rolled out of the booth. The entire restaurant turned to see the commotion, and I tried to melt into my seat. Four years later, I went on to marry that boyfriend but I called his parents mama and dad before we were even engaged. Mama started calling me daughter dear, and I was dad's baby girl, even though he saved me as baby grill in his phone. Dad's personality matched his boisterous laugh. A smart ass charmer, he oozed unpolished Southern charm through a West Texas drawl. He was a master electrician and signsman by trade installing and maintaining giant pole signs lining 700 miles of highway from El Paso to Corpus Christi. His beard was often flecked with paint and nearly every shirt he wore was pockmarked with welding burns. He was the youngest of our parents by far, 10 years younger than his wife and nearly 20 years younger than my folks, yet he was the most excited about my husband and 
and me popping him out a pop passel of grandkids. He had become a father at the age of 23. So by the time we were 25, he started to put the pressure on. I may have gotten married young, but I wasn't going to have kids young. We had shit to do and didn't have time for kids. After some particularly rigorous teasing, I finally retorted, for each time you ask me about grandkids, I'm a boarding one. Once the surprise left his eyes, Dad chortled at my sass, but he never asked me about it again. Eventually, my husband's job brought us out of Texas to sunny San Diego, and the distance between us and his parents began to grow. Dad and Mama began to trust the yelling heads on Fox News more than their son and me. Their insistence on parroting those toxic talking points instead of being interested in the truth broke my husband, a man of science and curiosity. In the shadow of the 2016 election, the fights between my husband and his father escalated to threats and insults. You're just saying that because you're funded by George Soros. If I, you were here, I'd kick your ass like a real man. Your liberal wife is brainwashing you with propaganda. I heard these smatterings and more yelled through the phone. My husband tried to keep me out of it, but I knew they were pinning his perceived liberalism on me, the easiest scapegoat. It hurt to distance myself from mama and dad, but my first obligation was always to my husband. I hoped for an eventual reconciliation, especially as we finally started talking seriously about growing our family, but years passed without one. The estrangement ended when dad fell during a job. This seemingly indestructible man who had previously survived a crane rolling over on him and any number of falls from high places was finally taken down by a faulty loading strap that snapped and caused a fall so sharp it broke his femur. My husband flew straight to the hospital and stayed for a week or so. A workable piece emerged. A broken bone rebuilt the bridge between us, even if not every wound had healed. A month later, on the day after Christmas, we got a frantic call from Mama. It was 7 a.m., and the earliness of the call alarmed us both. Dad had been checked in a few days prior for supposedly minor swelling related to his fall but now the doctor warned Mama she needed to get there immediately. She had no other information but promised to call when she got there. My husband was running on two hours of sleep. I saw the worst case scenarios working behind his eyes. I started to pack a bag just in case we needed to go while conjuring up counter scenarios in which everything was fine. When we didn't hear from Mama, my husband called the hospital. When he got off the phone, his face was hard and resolute. He looked suddenly aged. Tears brimmed in his eyes. He choked out simply, it's fatal. We bought the plane tickets while waiting for the Uber and learned that the phrase, my dad is dying, works wonders for getting you an earlier flight. But despite our desperate efforts, the mad dashes through the airport, willing the Uber driver to break any law necessary even running the last few yards from the hospital door to the elevator. We missed him. The broken bone that built the bridge also caused a blood clot. A mass of dad's own cells clumped together and stopped his heart three times before he was finally let go. When we finally arrived, we visited him in a quiet corner of the hospital, grateful we didn't have to do this in the morgue. We caressed his workman's hands, kissed his cold cheeks, and said what we could to comfort Mama. When we got home, the side-by-side -side queen beds in the master bedroom told a story. Mama's was impeccably clean and festooned with fluffy pillows, but unmade from her morning rush to the hospital. Dad's was still a tangle of sheets, a clutter of reading glasses, empty skull cans and dirty cups at easy reach of where he would have last slept. We changed the sheets of dad's bed so we could sleep next to mama because she did not want to wake up alone. In the first few days, my husband and mama were lost in grief. I took on the logistics of shutting down dad's business, coordinating with employees, subcontractors and customers each one expressing their deepest sympathies for our loss, 
but also needing to know what the plan was for their paychecks and projects. There are arrangements to be made, family to contact, finances to manage. I was grateful to do something to keep my head and hands busy, but there was another nagging concern I had to address. Four days after Dad's passing, I sat alone in the upstairs bathroom looking at a positive pregnancy test. After nearly a year of trying, it finally worked. I was pregnant. We were going to be parents. The noise I made was somewhere between a laugh and a sob. I grinned while tears streamed down my face. There was a kind of sad poetry to the fact that for a brief moment, dad and his grandchild existed in the same time and space, even if neither would ever know it. In fact, this baby was due on what would have been dad's 59th birthday. It felt like fate. We were meant to have this baby to ease our loss. I debated how to tell my husband. What is the best time to tell a man grieving his father that he is about to become one? I thought maybe I would hold on to the news for a few days to see how he was doing, but I only lasted a few hours. We sat on his childhood bed, the same bed on which we had worked up such ravenous teenage appetites some 17 years prior, and told him I was pregnant. He embraced me, and we laughed, and we cried, and we celebrated, and we mourned. A week later, I had to return to San Diego. My husband stayed behind to complete the Herculean task of emptying Dad's shop before the rent was due. I flew back on a Sunday, and grasping at normalcy, I caught a movie with friends. Of all the showings that evening, we decided to see Cats. I politely declined the flasks my girlfriend snuck in to help them survive the movie. Not quite ready to share my secret, I told them I was too tired from the flight. After the film, in the stall of the AMC ladies room, as we gabbed about the horror show we had just endured, I noticed a soft peach color on the toilet paper. I tried to talk myself out of what I'd seen. At home, I googled bleeding in the first trimester and tried to soothe myself with articles explaining that some spotting and bleeding was normal but the color on the toilet paper darkened to an eventual crimson. And by morning, the crimson wouldn't stop flowing. My ob Jin tried to sound optimistic. He said things like, well, we don't know, and bleeding doesn't always mean a miscarriage. But when I lay down for the ultrasound, he simply said, yep, that's a lot of blood. Grief numbed my entire body. I tried to compose myself enough to drive. My pregnancy app had told me that the embryo was the size of a peppercorn, barely a person at all. I tried to find solace in that fact, but when I finally got home, alone and broken, I sobbed in ways I did not know I could grieving not just the loss of this very wanted pregnancy, but the loss of that cosmic gift, the fact that dad and his grandchild had coexisted for a moment. I cried to my husband on the phone that night. I needed to give in to the grief, but he was now dealing with mama on his own and I did not want to burden him further. It was a difficult balance. I asked if he wanted to hear the one thing that had actually made me laugh like a madwoman when it first crossed my mind. What's that, baby doll? Cats was so bad, it fucking ended my pregnancy. The explosion of laughter on the other end of the call soothed me. The fact that we could still laugh, even if it was the kind that broke into sobs, proved we would make it to the other side of this disaster. To avoid being alone with my thoughts the next day, I slapped on an overnight pad and headed out, figuring if I could ever justify treating myself, today was that day. At a boutique in Fashion Valley, I found a set of earrings featuring several large crystals gradually growing inside. The largest one was about the size of a peppercorn. 
I had to have them. The very sweet clerk complimented my choice and made mundane small talk. What are you up to today? I was simultaneously offended that she was trying to snap me out of my sorrow and hyper aware that telling her it was none of her damn business would have been out of line. She had no way of knowing that this bauble was my personal miscarriage memorial or that dad had just died or that I was also grieving the loss of the comfort I had taken in knowing that baby and dad had crossed paths. I blinked back tears and told her I was just having a me day. It took us months to be ready again, but as the world devolved into pandemic chaos, we decided we couldn't keep putting our lives on hold. It was time to try again. This time, the tears the positive pregnancy test conjured were happy ones not interrupted by simultaneous grief. While there was anxiety and fear, especially during the early weeks, there was also hope. I carefully tracked days and milestones, marveling at and sometimes really disliking the changes in my own body. I've also seen my husband change. I hear dad so clearly when he calls our baby, my boy. It's bittersweet seeing in him the man we both still grieve. But in those glimpses, I know, our baby boy will know, at least in pieces, the man with the riotous laugh, who loved him without knowing him, and loved us the best way he knew. Coronavirus update, early days, Ron Pickett. Someone stole the tip box at the Starbucks. Now we're being asked to donate to replace those tips. Did the thief need it more than the baristas? I heard about it on Next Door. There is controversy between the board of our homeowners association and one of the homeowners. This is not the first time. Three emails update me. There must be more time to write because of the quarantine. Outside my window, Shimmering in the backlighting from the rising sun, a tiny spider is moving on its web, looking for even smaller prey. It's oblivious to the virus. The virus is oblivious to the spider. It is much, much smaller than the spider's prey. I hear the echo from the TV in the other room. We're on the same channel. News about COVID-19. What causes the delay? I calculate. It's only two-tenths of a second away for the sound. Don't the Wi-Fi and cable and satellite move at the speed of light? Where are the delays getting into the system? I have time to worry about these issues. Thanks to shelter in place. So many people walk past my window. Some I've never seen before. I should meet them, but maintain social distance, of course. I've never liked shaking hands and despised hugging I love it now, the new rules. My hermit inner self is in heaven. This can go on for me. We sneak out. We plan our outings for maximum joy. We take our sandwiches from Arby's drive through to the park. It's our new normal date night. We plan carefully for a trip to buy groceries like it was a world tour. I look up the numbers online. Can I see a flattening of the curve? Not yet, but I know it is hidden somewhere in the data I have access to. Or maybe they aren't releasing all the numbers, like the Chinese. There are rumors. Urns at Wuhan. Great significance. We went to Wuhan when we were in China. Malaria need meds work. I've taken them on trips to dangerous places on holidays and to Vietnam. There were greater dangers there. People are dying from aquarium cleaner and rubbing alcohol. I get emails from my doctor, my gym, my local theater, Panera, Bev Mo. I think I'll take them up on the free pickup of the sidewalk offer. My church, everyone wants to tell me what they're doing and what I must do. The US has overtaken China in the number of cases. New Orleans, Chicago, and Detroit are trying to overtake New York. I doubt that they can do it. Sports have been canceled. 
Wonder if I can get a bet on that spider I saw. Results of tests available are now available in 15 minutes. Some of them have accurate results. I almost wish I had some symptoms so I could get one. It's named for a beer brand. Well, not really. But sales of Cerveza Corona have fallen precipitously. Last time we were officially out, three weeks ago, I jokingly ordered a Corona from the bartender. We laughed. He filed for unemployment on Wednesday. I'm wasting time. I've got to do more. Motivate, motivate, motivate. Is this a waste of time? I spend time online. It's comforting. It's terrifying. My Wi-Fi becomes intermittent. This is really terrifying. I'm walking for exercise again, trying to preserve my feet from the ravages of old age and a previous injury. I've named my walks. Today I did Via Rancho Parkway. Yesterday we did K2, that's with Black's Hill. K1 skips Black's Hill. The fourth route is long, steep. I'm saving it for tomorrow. Oh, and a round trip to Target, 6,500 steps, including shopping. I take a shower every other day now. I skipped one day, but couldn't smell myself. Alert, alert, loss of sense of smell and taste are symptoms. I can smell other things, though, false alert. I gained three pounds one day. My scale is no longer my friend and a handful of chips to blame. I have a target, a range of acceptable weight. Fat? This isn't within my acceptable range. It took three days of starvation to get it off. Doesn't seem fair. When this is over, and it will be over, I'll look back on the things I didn't do. I look out the window again. I wonder whether the spider will catch his breakfast before he comes someone else's meal. A way to move up the food chain. was drafted in the Army after I got out of college in, um, uh, in May of, I graduated May of 69. By the following March, I was in the Army. And by the following November, I was in Vietnam. So um, <laughs> talk about a crazy transition. And if you can remember anything about that time, Justin, the world was out of control, uh, much like it is today. 50 years ago, maybe 50 years plus, but uh, we're back at ground zero, and I think in ways that are even more um, concerning and confounding than they were back then, because we had, even though it wasn't totally, totally on our side, we had a Congress and a government that sort of was functional. We had, um, we had people who seemed to be trying to keep guys like me from going to Vietnam um, in peaceful ways, and um, it, there seemed to be at least enough people listening to reason and rationality and not using other devices like social media to slam uh, and harass and hurt people. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little dicier now, if you ask me, and maybe that's part of my age. But um, when I look back and I think about it, and I think about Kent State, in particular, the, the piece that I'm going to read, um, and that was inspired not it's a little bit by what's going wrong today, but also by the fact that I had been invited to go to Kent State 10 years ago for the 40th anniversary. Um, and it just summoned up all these kinds of uh, feelings and reactions and observations that when I started to write it now, I mean, I, I didn't write about it then. I went and I participated. And then uh, there was a chance we were gonna be asked back for the 50th and that got canceled. Um, I sort of sat down and took stock of America now, America then, and America when I was going through this whole thing and and was around for Kent State. And that's what sort of prompted uh, my writing this piece that I called uh, Return to the Scene of the Crime. Black Panther co-founder Bobby Seale was there. So was the late great Congressman John Lewis and filmmaker Michael Moore, Country Joe McDonald too, and me. I was there. 
I'm talking about the 40th anniversary of the shootings at Kent State University, which took place on May 4th, 2010. The intended 50th anniversary this year, like most public events that were scheduled in the spring, was canceled. And that makes me wonder if the 40th anniversary 10 years ago when I was there might be the last hand-wringing occasion for members of my generation so deeply impacted by what happened at Kent State on May 4th, 1970. That would be our last chance to gather in that space around that moment. There remains too much pain and confusion and blame and misunderstanding that accompanies the Kent State shootings. All these years later, it's still present. You can feel it in the air on that large, sprawling campus in Kent, Ohio. On May 4th, 2010, I was at Kent State as part of a panel sponsored by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Our topic was, next stop is Vietnam, the war on record, to accompany the release of Bear Family Records compilation of the same name. A pristine box set that includes 13 CDs and a 304 page coffee table book. My partner, Craig Werner and I had co-authored a long essay for the book, which was a scaled down version of what would eventually become, We Gotta Get Out of This Place, the soundtrack of the Vietnam War, our award winning. My fellow panelists that day were Hugo Kiesing, who was the archivist for the Bear Family Collection, and old country Joe McDonald, the uh, musician, um, who'd written the foreword to that book, next to, to that coffee table book, Next Up is Vietnam, but also had penned one of the Vietnam anthems, I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die Rag. Our moderator was Lauren Anke, then Director of Education for the Rock Hall, who's now the Director of Music for National Public Radio. Lauren and I drove together to Kent from Cleveland, Ohio, where I flew in, and we met at the Rock Hall and drove to Kent. We quickly got acquainted personal and musical connections laying the groundwork. But I don't think either of us was prepared for what Kent State would be like that day. I remember asking at one point as we were driving down, how do you celebrate a tragedy? But I don't think we labored on that question very long and no sooner than 11 o'clock arrived and we were on campus. It was already packed with Kent State students, media, alumni, and a bunch of people from my generation, baby boomers. What we didn't know by arriving then was that a lot of the crowd was already waist deep in the big muddy, as Pete Seeger would say, as a result of several intense days of music, films, and speeches, including a truth tribunal that was led by Laurel Krauss, the sister of Allison Krauss, one of the four young people that was killed on May 4th, 1970, when 28 National Guardsmen fired nearly 70 rounds in 13 seconds, killing four and wounding nine. According to Ms. Krause, the Kent State Truth Tribunal was formed to quote, establish a clear and correct historical record to help heal the personal and collective wounds from this atrocity. Words like atrocity hung in the air that sunny afternoon. At high noon, all classes were recessed and the official commemoration began on the Kent State Commons. Many of the event's conveners were spirited undergrad Kent State females who spoke eloquently of why Kent State mattered to them today in 1970, and from 1970, this was 2010. At 12.24 p.m., the time of the 1970 shootings, the victory bell was rung 13 times, four for the students who were killed and nine for those who were wounded. Next, an assortment of eyewitnesses, family members of the deceased, an activist spoke. Sandy Schur, stuck in the neck by an Ohio National Guardman's bullet, was a girl with, quote, a bubbly personality who was always doing things for others, said a note from a friend that was preserved in a scrapbook kept by her sorority. I think about her every day, the Kent State chapter's current president, Sarah Franciosa, said, irony of ironies, Sandy Schur's mother had passed away that very morning. Jeffrey Miller was remembered as a drummer and a radio DJ whose five foot six stature earned him the, the on air name of Short Mort, recalled his, other brother, his older brother Russ. On the night of the shootings, still unaware that his brother had been killed, 
Russ watched news reports about Kent State with his grandmother in the Bronx. She asked him if Jeff would have been at the rally. No doubt, Russ Miller told her, knowing his brother's strong feelings against the war. But I wasn't concerned because I knew he would keep his head down, Russ said. No, he didn't. Jeff Miller died, his brother reminded us, shot in the mouth. How painful could this get? Just wait. 90-year-old Florence Schroeder, mother of Scott Schroeder, used a walker to make her way to the stage. On May 4th, 1970, I was 50 years old with brown hair and good legs, she laughed. Today, I'm 90 and can no longer pitch batting practice. Her son was an Eagle Scout and a member of ROTC, an honor student who was walking to class when he was shot in the back with a rifle more than a football field's length away. The death of a child is very hard, but life goes on, she said. Then she read the last line of a poem her son had written. Learning from the past is a prime consideration. I pray we have all learned that lesson, she added. Allison Krause's Kent State boyfriend, Barry Levine, spoke of a sweet, intelligent, loving, warm, intelligent, compassionate, creative, funny, giving, intelligent woman. She sat on the hill where you now sit, he told the audience. She walked on those paths where you now stand. Her laughter used to dance through the branches of these trees. Allison Krause was shot in the side as Levine pulled her behind a car for shelter from the gunfire. She fell mortally wounded in his arms. Levine had rarely spoken publicly about the events of that day, and it soon became obvious that his anger and outrage had been building for 40 years. Riffing on Bob Dylan's song, Who Killed Davy Moore, Levine made an impassioned, at times irate, appeal for justice for the shootings. Lauren and I were reeling, and we'd only been here for less than two hours. We caught up with Country Joe, who himself seemed woozy from a pushback he'd received from a bunch of Vietnam vets during a film screening the night before. How in the hell were we going to get through our presentation tonight, given how raw and hurt everyone seemed? Following the commemoration, we attended a reception in the student center, which was about as bizarre as any I've ever intended. To this point in my life, my experience with anniversaries had been upbeat, upbeat and celebratory. And while this had a hint of that, people embracing and rejoicing at seeing one another, it was downright macabre as folks like Alan Canfora, shot in the right wrist, and Thomas Grace, wounded in the left ankle, compared their May 1970 wounds. And then Dean Kaler, who was shot in the back and paralyzed that day, rolled up in his wheelchair and reminded his former Kent State classmates that the first letter he'd opened after he came out of a coma on Friday, May 8th, 1970, had these words, Dear Communist Hippie Radical, I hope by the time you read this, you are dead. I hadn't just lost my breath, I'd lost my bearings. So much resentment, so much pain, and it seemed as if nothing had changed in 40 years. I did not want to be a part of the closing event for the commemoration. I wanted to get as far away from Kent State as I could. And then I remembered my own experience of graduating from U.S. Army basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, just two days after President Nixon had ordered the invasion of Cambodia, and my worrying that as a soldier, I would be summoned to a college campus to aim a rifle at my fellow countrymen. It was a real fear, a legitimate possibility, like today's. But it never happened. Vietnam did, and strangely, there was more talk of the My Lai Massacre, the Pentagon Papers, and none of us being the last GI killed in Vietnam during my tour in 1970 and 1971 than there was of Kent State. Maybe we were because we were all living with the same dread. Hugo, Joe, and I made our presentation at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, May 4th, 2010, to a large, engaged, and heavily veteran audience. Even the battle-weary country Joe rose to the occasion as we gave the absorbed audience a sense of how vital music was to the men and women who served in Vietnam and the folks who stayed home. And after they came home, what it meant to the vets to get back. Hugo and I played excerpts from a number of those memorable songs. 
These boots are made for walking, Fortunate Son, Detroit City, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, and more while Joe strummed a few bars of his favorite song, I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die Rag. The response was heartwarming. One of the vets who came up to me later, a Vietnam vet against the war insignia on his old flak jacket, thanked me and said, hey, I'm glad you didn't play Ohio. We couldn't have handled that tonight. All I knew then, and what I felt that day 50 years ago, and what I feel strongly today in the throes of this COVID, con pa the COVID pandemic, racial unrest, police in the streets, is that language matters, words matter, and they can wound as much as bullets. The rhetoric of Nixon and his Vice President Spiro Agnew and Ohio Governor Rhodes and others calling the students at Kent State and even some of us who were overseas in Vietnam, bums, the worst element in our society, worse than the communists, the night riders, and the vigilantes, and calling us vets crybabies after we came home from the war and tried to stop it. The hate speech at that time is the vitriolic hate speech of today. Those words do have consequences. Just ask the students at Kent State. And I wonder, Ponder John Fogarty of Creedence Clearwater Revival. Still, I wonder who will stop the rain. All right, everybody, that is our show. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's VAMP Plan B. We hope you enjoyed these amazing, wonderful, fresh stories as much as we did, and I'm sure you did. So thanks for tuning in. We want to again thank our wonderful volunteer producer for this month, Jennifer Coburn. She is our beloved neighbor, and she is hilarious also. If you ever need a big laugh, please check out our YouTube channel for her videos. Look her up. So once again, I just want to tell you what the lineup this month was. Our performers were in order. Laura McCaffrey, James Sedden, Arthur Salm, Vamp First Timer, by the way, Ali Puente Douglas, Ron Pickett, and Doug Bradley. We want to thank all of them for joining us for this special VAMP edition. Also, just want to tell you a couple things. Coming up, we have Long Story Short in September. That's going to be on Thursday, September 3rd. The title of Long Story Short is going to be It's Not You, It's Me. So get your stories ready for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also, VAMP in September. The theme is 2020. We know you have a ton of stories for that. Uh, whether it's about this year or your 2020 hindsight, whatever. We've extended the deadline, and the deadline is now Wednesday, September 2nd. So get to writing those stories. And uh, all of this information can be found on our website, so say we all online com. And if you want to just contact us with any comments, questions, suggestions, anything, uh, as always, you can contact us at info at so say we all online com. Thanks again. We love you, and we can't wait to see you again soon. Bye bye. I didn't see you there. You just caught me doing some yoga. So um, I hear that the way to get people to watch videos is to do a sexy baby voice. So I'm going to try doing a sexy baby voice as the program director of So Say We All. So I want some feedback from you guys. Come on. Put it in the comments. Put it in the chat. And let me know what you think of my new sexy baby voice. And let me know if it's working, OK? Um, so I just wanted to um, thank our readers again for the night and um, just thank them for their words. So thank you to all the readers and thanks to Jennifer Coburn too. She's so pretty and she has like such pretty long blonde hair and we like to braid each other's hair. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll put a video up on YouTube of it and you, you guys can check that out. Would you like that? Just let us know, okay? <laughs> All right. Well, um, 
I forgot everything else I was going to say, so. We'll see you later, guys. <laughs>